must compliment you on not knowing exactly the number of chairs needed here. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have, uh, <laughs> I think we're live, yes. We are we're live. live, I think. We're live. Uh, so welcome uh, to this uh, sort of intimate uh, gallery talk with uh, uh, John Wind and myself, Charlie Steinbeck. Uh, I am the uh, director of the Berman Museum at Osiris College and also the curator with John Wind of this exhibition. Uh, as when we first uh, met, spoke about this idea, I was sort of adamant, I will be the curator, you know. Uh, but again, as, as things move forward, I became co-curator with John because I realized uh, I couldn't have done it with, without John. Um, the show came about, um, uh, quite honestly, because uh, John and I were having uh, lunch with um, our colleague from the Woodmere um, Art Museum, uh, Mr. Valerio, uh, and uh, he had done some work with John and with, uh, with Jerry, uh, John's father, on uh, a large scale sculptural piece uh, by Dina, which is, uh, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you, if you've seen it, to go to the Woodmere to see this uh, spectacular sculpture. 30 feet tall. Triangle. Three, 30 feet tall or something? 30 feet tall, yes. Oh. And uh, so having lunch with, with Bill, it uh, occurred to Bill that wouldn't a great exhibition be uh, just an exhibition of uh, Dina's stainless steel work? And uh, that's all I needed to hear from someone I respect uh, immensely. So uh, we moved forward very quickly and sort of made this happen. And so when was that lunch? A year and a half ago? Is that right? It was in the spring of 17. All right. So I'll so well, Sorry, or maybe 16. Spring of 16, yes. Anyway, it wasn't that long. <laughs> no. It wasn't that long. No, it was, it was um, so John is an accomplished uh, artist himself, uh, an entrepreneur, a uh, jewelry maker, uh, engaged in a lot of things uh, in uh, Philadelphia in, in the arts. And uh, John, do you have anything you want to add to that sort of introduction, that rambling introduction? I think it's a great introduction. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think it's one thing that really struck me about why did Dina have this separate body of work that was stainless steel, and it's that stainless steel does not play well with other metals. It it doesn't it doesn't weld to other metals. So almost by necessity, as she accumulated metal in her studio, she would put all the stainless steel uh, pieces to one side, and then at a certain point. You know, the muse spoke to her and she decided to start creating work just with the stainless steel sculpture. So in, in your work, you do a little welding yourself, but on a much smaller scale or? or Very small. But it's still welding. Yeah, I don't personally oh, yeah. do the welding. Though. Okay. Yeah, for some reason, even though I had a lot of access to learning how to weld from mm -hmm. Nina, that wasn't what spoke to me. It was more just the idea of uh, assemblage and okay. combining elements, and I did it in a different way. I do it in a different way. But to do welding, it's not a self-taught thing. You have to learn how to do it, right? Correct. So who taught Dina? So Dina went, uh, she started by studying at the Cheltenham Arts Art Center um, with a sculptor named Leon Sitarchik, and mm -hmm. he taught her the, the fundamentals of welding. Right. But then she wanted to up her game, and she went to a bridge weld, a, a welding school with 30 burly guys whose intention was to then weld bridges for a living. In, in, um, in Philadelphia? In Philadelphia. Does uh, that still exist, that school? I, I'm not sure, but I recently came across her diploma, so I could look it up. <laughs> was it in, Dina's uh, husband, my father, Jerry, is in the audience? Did, was that in Philadelphia that she did the bridge welding? Philadelphia was the area. Okay. And she was the only woman in this class of yeah. 30, and the only artist, I'm assuming. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so she learned how to do TIG welding and MIG welding and you know, really... The TIG welding is electrical. Is that what the TIG is? The machine? You're, yeah, I think, I think so. Sure, Charlie. And then there's gas yeah. welding. Yeah, and right. she had the whole setup. So right. eventually she left Cheltenham Art Center and in the early 90s opened her own uh, studio, rented right. a space in Maniac, right. uh, Maniac section of Philadelphia, right. um, where she worked for about 10 years and then moved to a studio in South Philadelphia. Right, right, right. So she originally was a painter, or drawer, painter, whatever. Correct. What, what caused the shift from uh, 
sort of 2D to 3D? What, what, yeah. what precipitated um, that? As, as she told it, she was introduced to welding by a friend of hers who was also a painter, but was doing some welding in her garage. And the minute Dina saw this, uh, what she called an additive approach to art making, mm -hmm. by simply you know, attaching one piece to the next to the next, working intuitively, uh, building it as it, as, as it evolved, mm -hmm. uh, it spoke to her. And uh, in comparison, facing a blank canvas, she said, was never a natural thing for her. It was, it was always like a more, it was harder than having a, a pile of, of metal, and right. that the metal spoke to her in a way that the blank canvas didn't. So she made a very quick transition from painting to sculpture right. uh, at that point, which was in the um, late 1970s. Right. So, so having uh, sort of the metal at, at her disposal, but I, I would think that the, the blank canvas sort of is the same way she f would feel when she went to the junkyard because everything was still blank. I mean, she, so she was responding to the junkyard and she'd bring this stuff home to the, home to the studio. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to the junkyard with her to? <laughs> I did, yes. Um, I so to... did you give her your opinions or did she overrule your opinions or did she like your opinions? Or like, this is a nice piece of metal or? Yeah, she was pretty open-minded about it. You right. know, and, and you know, saying yes, I'll take this bucket of saws um, didn't mean she had to use them. So she was, you know, pretty inclusive about um, you know taking my ideas. We as a family had more than one experience where we'd be driving down the Schuylkill Expressway, and there would be a muffler on the side of the road, and she would you know screech over <laughs> to 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 pull it into the car. So you know her her. Um, Attraction to scrap metal was pretty broad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, but I mean, one can, I mean, I, I used to live in New York City, uh, and one of the great things that I would love to do is on trash day is pick things out of the trash, but I realized very quickly that it, I didn't have room for all this stuff. Did that happen with Dina? Did she bring all this stuff home? And, what would she do? Would she, did she put it out on trash day when she got tired of it? What, what happened? Well, she had the studio, so there was always- Yeah, a, but it's only so much space. I mean, so right. she self-edited. She, self okay. you know, she, she would go and get more when, as it was running low. Or, oh, okay. was, or, or, I mean, she worked in a very um, episodic way. She, she belonged to Nexus Gallery mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, a cooperative gallery, for 20 some years. And every two years, she had a show. Okay. So in a pretty disciplined way, she would, um, you know, once once a show ended, she would just kind of cogitate and, and you know look around, and she was very uh, into art in a right. broader sense. And she and my father traveled extensively uh, to the various art fairs and biennales right. around the world. So it, it soaked in, and then at a certain point, she was ready to start work on her next body of work, right. and that's when she'd go to the back to the junkyards, mm -hmm. to the flea markets and uh, start looking for material, I think with a little bit of an idea of where she wanted to go with it, but not, not right. you know, right. really defined. And then, depending on what she found, she let the materials speak to her, right. and then embark on a body of work. Uh, and so, back to the stainless steel, so at a certain point in 1985, 86, she came across a lot of stainless steel, and I'm sure that that um, you know, spoke to her and suggested starting to do um, a body of work in stainless steel. Another thing that led to a, a, sp a specific collection was that in 1984, um, I started making jewelry while I was in art school in London, um, jewelry that looked an awful lot like this. It was um, in inspired subliminally, I'm sure, by Dina's um, assemblage aesthetic, which at that point was really only uh, pedestal and ground-based work. Right. So I started making some brooches by sticking flea market finds into rolled out clay right. and um, putting a safety pin through the back and then the next day it was hard and I'd wear it out to the clubs and uh, got attention and um, interest from local stores and one thing led to another. Um, just as an aside, another guest today is Hilary J, who uh, was my close friend back in that era and is to this day. <laughs> And uh, Hillary came for a vacation to London, and I said,
said, uh, listen, we can have a vacation, but you have to help me do a little work because the Thompson twins, which were you know, the musical gods of 1984, they, through their friend who was my barber, um, wanted to commission a collection of jewelry uh, from me to wear on their next world tour, an album cover, which, uh, P.S., to this day, days of, days of future past, uh, they're wearing, Alana is wearing my double brooch on the cover. So Hillary and I did it together and ended up delivering it to them and having a very heady 1980s moment uh, with the Thompson twins. So, uh, and starting a business together eventually. Right. But the point of that story is that once Dina started wearing uh, these brooches and double brooches, she was inspired to lift her sculptures off the floor and onto the walls. Right. And that began a very fertile period for her of creating uh, what we all call brooches for buildings. Right. So that's a perfect segue to talk yes. about this piece here, which is one of the larger pieces yeah. in the exhibition. And Jerry, your father, just commented how different mm -hmm. the piece looks here than it looked. Was it out on the on the on the uh, what, the, pat the patio, the deck? That's how describe, describe it a little. And well, you, you imagine, loved it. <laughs> so imagine basically the house and the pool in the kind of the center, and this was on one side of the, the house overlooking the pool, and the other big piece over there the was, the, was on the other side of the know, other wall. Yes. So basically they were kind of, so I always saw them only from either the tennis court or the pool, and uh, looked totally different. The, this one in particular was tucked really tight between the top of a door and an eave. And uh, the people who enjoyed it the most were the birds who built nests in it year after year. <laughs> and when we, when we uh, took it down to have it cleaned and ready for this show, there was a lot of uh, souvenirs of those birds. <laughs> <I'll say that laughs> way. And it's amazing how many uh, birds have been trying to fly in the front door to come up here. <laughs> They, they we miss, they we miss kept them out. Yeah. It's their home. Yeah, yeah. Another thing you didn't get to appreciate in that context was this incredible shadow play. Right. Which, right. Charlie, you did the lighting for this show, and you should talk for a minute about you know what, your thoughts about the, the shadow of the work. Well, it's not. It's not. It's not uh, the thoughts about the shadow, but it's it's more importantly when you're. Uh, I hate to use the word design, but when you're figuring out. Uh, an exhibition and you're thinking about number one the artwork but you're thinking about the environment that it's in you know and you know what sort of lay people don't realize is that all of the choices when you walk through the door are made for a reason like the reason it's this not not that it's gray but it's this color of gray is important the reason that the platforms are that color, you know, uh, is a reason. Uh, and then the lighting uh, is really, it's almost like the work is sort of, again, this sounds sort of uh, hokey, but it, you know, the work kind of tells you what it wants, you know, and, it, and it's got these sort of things sticking out. And as soon as you put one light on, you realize that those shadows are really important. I, I mean, I actually did not think about them beforehand until I started trying to light it, you know, so, but then it made perfect sense, you know. Right. The minute, the minute there's any lighting, there is shadow, and then you realize there's an opportunity here right, right. to make these shadows a, a really significant part of the uh, presentation. Right, right. And, and, and I think it really uh, truly enhances the work, but also adds another dimension. Even though it's a flat dimension, it adds this whole other dimension. Really, really. Uh, Dina talked a lot about the shadows in mm -hmm. time, right? That was right. important to her. Especially during the shows when she showed them. Right. Same idea when she had her shows mm -hmm. in Nexus or at um, the Viridian Gallery right. in New York. That she also, right. in 1990, she had a show in, in New York that was primarily stainless steel work. Right. right. So, same idea. Yeah. Could, could we go talk about that work over oh, there? Yeah, because. Sure. Uh, that's one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition. Is that okay? Is yeah. that why you chose it for the catalog cover? Or for yep. the, the exhibition card? Is that what I did? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> this piece, yeah. Yeah, this piece here, yeah. Um, I, I think that besides, um, besides, you know, that it's a, 
Uh, on one level, it's simple, but on another level, it's complex. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy the fact of this sort of recognizable yes. thing. You know, it's a, I guess it's a pressure meter or something like that. Uh, or it says it's so it's from a Mack truck. So um, <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I don't have the glasses on. But it, you know, it's. Um, yeah, it doesn't it's, tell you exactly what it is, but you're right, there's a Mack truck logo. Yeah. And then the manufacturer, Euro Instrument Corp, Oceanside, New York. <laughs> yeah. But what, what I think it's really, what I really like about it is, uh, and I, the word meaningless is not the right word, but in the, in the midst of this meaningless sort of conglomeration, there's this thing, you know, which we don't know what the meaning is, but mm -hmm. it, we know it has meaning, and we know it had a purpose, you know. And I, lo I love that uh, sort of contrast, those, those two yeah. things go together. And I, I think she does it on other things, you know, where there's a, a piece, like a saw blade or something, mm -hmm. like it's a piece of something. Uh, but this is really like this, we know what a saw blade does, you yes. know, it cuts, whatever. We know that does something, but we don't know what it does, you know. And, and I, I think that adds to the level of mystery to the piece, and it sort of becomes sort of this sort of ongoing thing, and and that's not the only reason, but that's one of the things that really draws me to this yeah. piece. Yeah. I, I like how you wrote in your essay as well that there's uh, vestiges of the, of these elements' former lives as machines, right? And that there is a sense it's 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 not a an actual functional machine, but and having a dial like that really suggests uh, the energy and the, um, the the previous life that a lot of these materials came right. from. Well, and also uh, having that there, sort of in, in some sort of way, you know, suggests like, well, does this have a life? Mm -hmm. Is that is that sort of piece of uh, technology adding life to this thing that doesn't look like it's supposed to be a machine? You right. Know? Uh, it, you know, so um, so it, it's really it's really quite beautiful. The the forms, the shapes, uh, uh, you know, one can sort of. Um, sort of analyze those a lot, but I think since we know, I guess we know that it's all found material, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that there's this wire mesh. mesh here that obviously had a circle cut out of it, and you know, this circle here, um, I, I guess I would have, what I really would have loved, and I think it would be really sort of instructional for all sorts of people, is to actually see the the uh, selection process that mm -hmm. Dana went through, like how, you know, you know, was she selecting quickly, or was she making piles of things, knowing, or, or th say, thinking, I need a round thing, I need a big right. round thing, I need a small round thing, you know, and, and how all that went out. It was very intuitive. That was one of her favorite words, and the way that she worked, she had a low steel table, I mean, really low, like maybe two feet from the ground. Mm -hmm. And she had a pile of bricks and a pile of cinder blocks. Right. And then she had bins and barrels and boxes full of her different scrap metal, loosely organized, right. not, not that much. Right. And, but what, um, were the, what were the bricks and cinder blocks? Okay. Well, so she would pick the first piece. Let's say it was uh, you know, this uh, kind of shell. Right. And uh, she'd place it, and then the next piece. And in order to hold them in place while she worked, she would kind of prop them with bricks or cinder blocks, depending on the scale. And once she got enough pieces in place that she started to see um, a form, she would, did she spot weld first, or did well, she just did it? She used those uh, um, clamps. Clamps, she used the clamps. And She's then only once she felt comfortable with the, with the, with the resulting sculpture, mm -hmm. Uh, and she typically moved and changed. This was kind of the longest process, and only then she started welding. Right. So the entire sculpture would have been set up and clamped and supported with bricks? Not the entire, probably about 70% okay. of this, and then adding to this as she continued. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she replaced, she removed items. Right. So it's not only adding, it's also removing it until she kind of felt that it's right. Right, and I've seen, I saw at times she worked on multiple sculptures at once. So she would have you know, three or four pieces from a body of work, and as she found a part, she would go, does it go here or here? It kind of, you know, just trusting that it, when, it, when it was the right spot or the right piece, it would, um, she would know it. But, um, I mean, I haven't spent that much time 
in it. I mean, I love going to see artist studios, but I haven't actually spent that much time in the studio while an artist is working. Mm -hmm. But I have, I have the notion that a lot of artists, they don't work on a single piece. I mean, you know, they're, they're bouncing around, you know. Right. Um, and even if it's someone making something that's realistic, I think there is a, a process of wanting to exclude and include and what, what do you do? And I think it's a, it's, it's a sort of, sort of uh, the creative process. I mean, you, did, you don't just like make the mark right. and you're done. I mean, if you make that's the mark and that's the artwork, there are probably, I'm guessing, my analogy is there are a hundred similar marks right. made before you get the final mark. And I think that's a part of the process that people don't understand. That's right. how artists work. You know? and that's it's not, it's not just, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think, I think um, she probably always worked that way, even when she was doing paintings. It was yeah. always a process of exploration and deciding and changing and, and stuff like that, right? Correct. I mean, isn't that the way, way you work too, with, with your work? Yeah, it's yeah. very, very similar. Yeah. The, the one exception was that when Dina was painting, her, earlier in her career she was doing abstract expressionist, very brushy or palette knife work, yeah. uh, inspired by Hans Hoffman, yeah. with whom she, stu she studied with one of Hoffman's students. Right. Then she switched, uh, whose name was um, Sam Feinstein. Then she switched to a studio of an artist named um, Tom Goen, and Tom had started as an abstract expressionist, but then had moved on to more hard edge painting in the spirit of Al Held. And that was like the, um, as uh, Judith Stein wrote in the essay for the catalog for this show, she said the collective temperature of the art world was cooling. And I, I thought that was beautifully said. So the hard edge painting required you to plan it all ahead of time because it was all based on laying tape down and figuring out what shapes go where, and that did not speak to Dina. Right. It, was, it was not intuitive enough, it was right. too planful. Right. Right. So uh, this really, you're right, that she would, right. she would place and think and, pretend and, and explore. Right. One thing I, about this piece in particular, the name of it, it's so perfect for it, it's called Sundial, and once you see that and you think about this, this gauge and you think about you know, an old-fashioned sundial and, and the way that the shadows are such an integral part, back to our conversation about shadows, it seems like an inevitable name, but Dina's philosophy about names was it always happened after the fact. Uh, so it wasn't that she was setting out to create an abstract sundial, it's that afterwards she looked at it, it evoked the sundial for her, and in a kind of casual but ultimately meaningful way, that became its name. But there were times that we would be in her studio as a family, or she'd bring a piece home and over the dinner table, she's like, so what should I call this? What, what does this look like? You know, and, and she sort of uh, joked about it because right. she didn't need the names personally, right. but she understood that they were, um, they opened doors for the viewer um, to access the work. She also understood that having you know hundreds of sculptures all called untitled <laughs> was an admin, it would be an administrative nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. Let's go. Let's go look at one of the pieces that's yeah, like right. sitting down. I'm sorry, I keep bouncing around, but you know that's good. That's great. Uh, um, it's in her spirit. Uh, well, we're, 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 we're all. Let's, let's, now we'll go ahead and get to this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the title of this one is. Uh, yeah, down here. Seesaw. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. Uh, Obviously, there. <laughs> I, I think that's the, the perfect title, like like mm -hmm. sundial. Um, right. It seems inevitable. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but one thing I uh, I noticed on this piece, and I think I commented on it when we were selecting, is this is one of the few pieces where she actually uh, burnished the metal. You know, and typically the metal was left in its existing state from yeah. the, from the junkyard. What what sort of provoked or propelled her to sort of do that to this yeah. piece? That, she, she loved doing this, the grinding into the metal with, right. a, with a grinding wheel. Right. Um, and it, there's, there were two, uh, as, I, as I understand it, two motivations to it. One was an homage to David Smith, mm -hmm. who did a very similar surface right. yeah. treatment on his, uh, especially his QB series. Right. Right. Uh, and then the other is a connect, well actually now I thought of a third. The, the second is a connection to her own history as an abstract painter. Right. And by 
activating the surface of the metal with, with these grinding marks and created, it almost looks like brush strokes. Right. So, she, so that, that was important. And then I think the third piece, uh, especially after my jewelry started to become part of the conversation, it really creates a jewel-like uh, right. surface. It shines, it catches the light. And um, in general, one of the things that Dina wrote is that um, she, she liked the idea that these pieces, which are in fact very heavy, appear very light. Right. And the, adding those uh, grinding marks definitely uh, enhances that sense of lightness. But again, um, were there other, because I don't, I guess I don't remember a lot of other pieces that have the grinding marks. Is there, there, there are several in the show, okay. the little brooches. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so it was, it was, so it was okay. all right, all right. So she did it by 30% half. Okay, yeah. okay. Right. Um, in general though, there, it was very important to Dina that all of the sculptures had some sort of uh, surface surface treatment that tied all of these disparate elements together. Right. So in the case of the grinding, obviously that was it. In other pieces, she waxed, with the stainless steel, she waxed the surface of the metal once the piece was done. And you can see how it, it unifies things. Right. Um, in her non-stainless work, she either varnished the entire piece, which added a shine right. and cohesiveness. In some series, she painted the metal, and so that created a different kind of unity. Right. So it's interesting. Or for outdoor pieces, she allowed it to rust. And then the rust um, created a, a consistent color and finish. Uh, and when you were growing up, uh, was when so the, the when did the sculpture work start? It started just as I was leaving the house in okay. the late seventies. So it was planned, you know, get John out and I can start making this be more room. Well, and then when my brother left the house five years later, yeah. that coincided with her absolutely most productive period, yeah. which was the nineteen eighty five to the early two thousands. Right. So she was an empty nester and she yeah. had time and uh, you know a burning desire to make art. That's great. Yeah. So was, when you were growing up, was there paintings or drawings or sculptures in the house? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, a lot. There, her painting was always uh, in the house. And as uh, my parents started to get involved in the Philadelphia art community and started buying more art right. from local and national artists, one by one, her paintings would come down off the wall to make room for others. And so uh, there was a very eclectic approach. Right. And then once the sculpture started, then again, it was mostly her sculpture in the house, and over time it, it started to share, uh, have to share with right. others. Right. Yeah. And so the shift from, in scale, from something large to something small, that's, I, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to go back over to here now. So uh, how, how were those decisions made? Or we know that uh, intuition played a lot, but yeah. did this, the scale of the, of the components play a lot in her determining what, what the size should be, or? Was it something else, you know? Well, I think it, for sure the scale of the components um, you know, suggested that this would make, this wants to be a small piece. Right. In addition, as she was designing a show, she was mindful of, of, a, sh of, you know, of a show, that there should be some big statement pieces mm -hmm. and there should be smaller pieces. Right. The, the economic reality of wanting to sell work as an artist, it's going to be a lot easier to sell a smaller piece than you know a, a one right. that demands an entire wall. Right. So she was being uh, you know practical in that way. Right. right. As a as a side note, later in her career, she decided enough with being practical, and she got very interested in doing much larger, more public oriented sculpture, installation based. Mm -hmm. So uh, the last three shows that she had in the early two thousands were environments, not discrete objects right. at all. And that was the direction that she was moving in. Um, so, I mean, how, how big were these environments where, that she was? The, uh, one, Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Well, that was at, that, that was, is that the one that was at? Uh, at the Urban Outfitters, right, right, headquarters right, right. of the right. Navy Yard. It, originally at Nexus Gallery, it was an 18 foot square, okay. uh, 10 feet tall, and it was just this cascade of hanging uh, old car parts, carcasses, right. Um, Soutine was one of her favorite artists, and that kind of you know bloody um, butcher shop vibe. Uh, really, she translated it with, out of these car parts, uh, but in the process, creating something kind of magical and uh, very unexpected. Yeah. 
what, one thing, just as an aside, that in terms of all of these found objects, and in that piece in particular, these, the uh, flanks of cars and bumpers and old tires, uh, Dino was upcycling before I think the term was even invented. You know, she really was conscious and um, it was really important to her to show, to take objects that had outlived their useful lives and give them a new uh, aesthetic reality. So the Hanging Gardens was very much about that. And then the next installation she did was called Black Islands. And for that, she had a, a company flatten and then roll uh, like a hundred um, fenders. And then she painted them black and then scattered them on these black rubber mats, um, th uh, three islands uh, on the floor of Nexus Gallery, and um, had a, a short staircase on the side of the room and you could walk up and look overhead as if you were looking at some kind of post-apocalyptic uh, island. Right. And you know, being from Israel, being very involved in, in uh, politics, right. I mean, Dina was always thinking about uh, the political situation right. and the environment and geopolitics, and this was her way of addressing it in an aesthetic way. So she started moving away from the found object, per se, and then actually acquiring something that she knew she was going to modify. Yeah, that was, that, that that was, was a big she, shift. That was the way she was moving. You're right, good point. Right. She also started doing some casting of aluminum, um, gathering found objects, right. having them cast, right. and then with the flashing that was on, you know, still on the edge, and, with all kind of, and mixed with found aluminum, right. which also is a metal that is, uh, doesn't weld to other metals well. I don't know the science of it, but it's a, it, again, doesn't play well with others. <laughs> yeah. So she was, uh, she was starting to create more of her own right. raw materials. Right. So I need, I need to ask a question that maybe it's like, maybe it's not, there's not an easy answer, but I, 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 I get the sense from everything we've talked about and, and seen the work that I would imagine Dina had very strong opinions. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're laughing, yeah. am, I, am I right? Or? Yeah, she did. I mean, she wasn't forceful in, um, you know, in, in, in sharing them, but she had a strong, uh, a strong spirit and right. you know in terms of the journey of her art she definitely knew what she wanted to right. do right. And, and achieve so uh, I'm not asking but I, I'm really curious what yes your father and you think that how she would respond to this exhibition would she would she be I, I hope she would be pleased but how would she sort of critique it what what, what would she say is wrong or right or anything like that. I mean, do you, do you see uh, something? Interesting that question. You, you know. Do you have, do you want to answer that? I think she would have loved it. She would have loved it. She would have loved the, the way you hung it. I think she would have loved the color combination with the, the red uh, and the gray walls. I think the shadows she would have gotten. Right. You know, she, yeah. and the shadows she would have She would have loved right. the shadows in the sense. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is, Part of uh, the process that I enjoy uh, working with an artist, it, and I said it in my, my sort of essay thing, yeah. is I, I, I said, I used the word argue, but I love you know, that sort of like, you know, what do you mean? I, that doesn't make, you know, and I love, because I think it, uh, it's, it's important for me as a curator to really understand what the art is, but I think it's like uh, being a good editor. You know, say you know, no, that, that's the wrong word. That's, no, you can't say that. You know, and I think that part of the process. So I didn't have that. I had you, but I didn't have her. You know, and so that's why I'm really curious about uh, what you think her response would be. The one thing I think she would have had a hard time with was how well you edited down, because mm -hmm. she was a maximalist at heart, and she would have liked to have a few more sculptures. I mean, Charlie, there's all that <laughs> wall there. You know, you could have put another sculpture yeah, there. Yeah. So you can imagine so, that argument, <laughs> right? For sure, for sure, yeah. Great. So, well, this, um, this has been a real treat for me. Yeah, and, oh, and, thank and, you, and, and, uh, and uh, it's too bad the show uh, has to come down when it does, because uh, people have really enjoyed it, and. Uh, it looks so beautiful yeah. in space. So. Hillary, did you want to share something? I have a question. Yeah. Um, did Dina uh, manipulate some of these materials, or were they uh, as is? I believe Beside they were, the surfaces, were yeah. they cut? I, no, I believe they were pretty much as is. Okay. The one thing that she tended to cut was car was sides of cars. Okay. Um, but that is not part of the show. Do you agree? Do you think no. that there was anything manipulated or cut? 
No, no. As it's as really the place, and if you look at this, I, I remember this piece, the, the sale, for those of the students, when she, she kind of was working on this, it was just basically finding the objects and placing them, and kind of playing with this. So, no, I don't think she manipulated it. The manipulation was basically only in the, the placement of the, the components. Yeah, I, this sail, I love the, um, the perforated, well, the sail. The, yeah. There's such whimsical materials. This piece had, it's called uh, ironing domesticity, and there's literally a steam iron just kind of tucked in there. So there's also a kind of dry humor in all of, in all of her work. Anyway, Charlie, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. The, the thank show you, John. Thank you, John.